Right now, we think there are over 400 different primary immune deficiencies, and you could look at that as 400 different primary immune deficiencies. But we all know we're all part of the same herd. We are 400 different beautiful and similar zebras. So I'm going to approach PI from that context. I'm not going to call out individual diseases except for one slide. So we are a singular community, and what holds us together is our immune systems have made a mistake. They either are doing something too much, something too little, or they are misdirected in the wrong direction, and sometimes all at once. And boy, is that frustrating. You would think if you had an immune deficiency, you couldn't possibly get an autoimmune disease, because isn't that the opposite? But no, when immune systems make mistakes, they can make mistakes in multiple ways. So I'm going to talk about this. this. This graph represents the growth in the different types of primary immune deficiencies going back to 1979, when primary immune deficiencies were first recognized. What I'd like to highlight here is there has been a doubling in the last 10 years. Some of this research has been fueled by you. If you did a walk and raised money as part of your walk, your research has funded our interest and in our understanding of all of these different primary immune deficiencies. So you can take credit for some of the knowledge that's on this slide. So I'm going to start off with the basics. And the way that I've crafted this talk is I'm going to try and tie, rather than just sort of give you a lecture on what the immune system is, I'm going to try and tie it to different aspects that affect people with PI. So I'm going to try and tie it to some of the conditions and some of the features that you all have. So what does it mean? Well, it can look like anything. If you talk to most doctors, they're going to say, well, if you have a primary immune deficiency, you have too many infections, or you have infections that are too severe or too peculiar. And indeed, that is true, but that's certainly not the only thing that characterizes people with PI. There's also autoimmune disease, and that is when your body attacks itself. And I'll say more about that in some detail in a few slides, but the concept is our immune system is supposed to understand that it shouldn't attack us. And each us is unique, and that's why it's difficult to transplant organs from person to person, because my self isn't the same as your self according to your immune system. So autoimmune disease, just by having autoimmune disease, you know the immune system has made a mistake. That's not supposed to happen. I'm going to compare and contrast autoimmune disease with inflammation. Inflammation is when the tissue gets red, hot, tender, and swollen. And I'll say more about that in a few minutes. Inflammation and autoimmune disease can sometimes go hand in hand. They can sometimes overlap. We are learning more about GI health, and I will have a little bit more to say about that. We know that our GI health is very much driven by the status of our immune system even if we can't exactly understand how and why. So I will say a few more words about that. And then I know a, a very common concern of people with PI is this concept of brain fog and fatigue. In fact, thanks to research that IDF has done, we know that fatigue is the number one quality of life harm that happens to people with common variable. And so I think it's worth spending some time talking about that. As I go through a description of these five different features that I think are reasonably common in people with PI, I'm going to try and attach the parts of the immune system that are relevant for that. And then at the very end, just under the umbrella of trying to give you some language to help you understand the rest of the meeting, I will talk about genetics at the very end, again, with the hope of just giving you some uh, grounding in the funny names that we often use. Okay, so one of the problems with the immune system is you can't point to it. And I know that's a source of frustration, and I love that John Boyle brought it up in his opening talk. It's so hard to communicate what an immune deficiency is to your friends and relatives, and it's because you can't show an x-ray, you can't point to it, you can't, um, you can't palpate it, it's not like you can feel it. Our immune system is everywhere and anywhere. It circulates in our blood, it percolates through our tissues, so that makes it hard to point to, and it also means that problems with the immune system can show up in every single organ of the body, from skin to brain to lung to kidney to pancreas. Every single organ can be affected because our immune system percolates through it. So what is it that constitutes the immune system? In a broad sense, we conceive of it as white cells and proteins. The main proteins of the immune system are antibodies and complement. I'm not going to say much about the complement system, but it is the most evolutionarily ancient part of our immune system. It dates back to sea sponges, believe it or not. And so um, it is the most evolutionarily ancient part of our immune system, and it does play a key role in host defense. I will say a few words about it. So when we in immunology talk about the immune system, this is typically what we're talking about, white cells and proteins. That's not entirely fair, though, right? 
we have a lot of different systems to help defend against infection. Our skin, the integrity of our skin. There are proteins in our tears and our saliva that help kill bacteria and viruses. So it's a lot more than this, but if you're talking to an immunologist, this is usually what they're thinking constitutes the immune system. Now, although the immune system circulates everywhere and percolates through all of our tissues, there are some locations where it especially likes to hang out, and you know this. So all of our immune system is born in our bone marrow. B cells come out right from the bone marrow, and in fact, that's why they're called B cells, B cells for bone marrow. T cells have to go to the thymus. I don't know if, does this work? Yeah. So T cells have to go to the thymus, and that's where they get educated about what they're supposed to fight and what they're not supposed to fight. And then we have a series of lymphoid organs, the tonsils, the adenoids, the lymph nodes. Those are all shown in blue here. And the spleen, which is sort of a giant lymph node, is the easiest way to think about it. And these are really important for where the cells come together to have a conversation. It turns out that the cells don't like to operate independently. They have to come together and communicate in order to optimally defend against infections. And those, uh, those blue lymphoid organs in this diagram are where that all takes place. <clears throat> so the lymphoid organs are important. And I'm going to show you a picture in about, believe it or not, 20 slides. I'm still going to be talking about this. So I will show a picture of what's actually happening in those lymphoid organs, how the cells actually touch each other. But having a structure where the cells can be facilitated to come together and communicate is really important. And that's the concept behind these lymphoid organs. Now, I thought I would just say a word about size of lymphoid organs, because this is always a cause of consternation. Those lymphoid organs, you know the glands in your neck, they get bigger when you have a cold and they shrink back down. That's normal, getting bigger and shrinking, because the more cells that are having a conversation, the bigger the party, the bigger the lymph node. And then when they've done their job and they go out into the peripheral blood or they go wherever they need to fight the infection, then that lymph node will shrink back down. So it's normal for them to sort of grow and shrink. Sometimes a lymphoid organ grows and stays big. It doesn't necessarily mean cancer. It just means the cells didn't know they were supposed to go away. All right, so I'm going to go through these one at a time, and I'm going to talk about the immune cells and proteins that are involved in each of these. So we're going to start with infection. And I thought I would just say we do not understand so much about some of these. We're pretty good at understanding how the immune system works to fight infections. We're maybe okay at understanding the basics of autoimmune disease and inflammation. We are not very good at understanding GI health, and I will acknowledge that up front. And then um, brain, uh, we don't understand at all. I'm going to highlight a talk that I believe is happening tomorrow on fatigue that is uh, led by Jude Hajar. She's done a lot of the research in the United States on fatigue specifically in common variable. I think she's really forging some new information and new understanding of that. All right, so let's start with infections. Does anyone recognize this cell type? Have you ever seen it before? It is a poly or a neutrophil. So just to orient everyone, the things that look like donuts are red cells. So that's what carries hemoglobin. This is a neutrophil, and you can always recognize it because the purple stuff in the middle is the nucleus, and it's got that funny shape. So we're going to start off by talking about neutrophils because they are the heavy lifters when it comes to bacterial infections. So I'm going to hopefully show you a movie here, and before I show it to you, the, the two green dots on the right-hand side of this are bacteria. This is actually Streptococcus pneumoniae, and the sort of gray thing that looks a little bit amorphous in the middle of the screen, that is the neutrophil. And when I show this movie, you're going to watch the neutrophil crawl up to the bacteria, engulf it, and eat it. It's actually super satisfying to watch. <laughs> so here goes the neutrophil. It's squishing around. Wait for it. Shoop. Uh, and it's gone. Look, those bacteria are actually gone. They're digested. They are not going to cause harm. This is what we want our neutrophils to do. This is what our neutrophils do for us every single day. Neutrophils are the power lifters when it comes to bacterial infections. Now, it turns out that neutrophils function better with antibody and complement. So yes, it's the neutrophil that's actually doing the killing, but they're much better at it if you have enough antibody. So that's shown schematically in this little cartoon. If you go to the bottom right where my arrow is, those yellow circles are uh, bacteria. And if they are coated with complement or coated with antibody shown here, it just makes the neutrophil more able to reach around it and eat it. And when you saw that movie, I hope you noticed the arms of the neutrophils were sort of reaching around the bacteria. That's the part that's facilitated by antibody and complement. 
So I'm going to contrast that relatively easy story of bacterial infections now with viral infections. Viral infections are different and they're harder. Bacteria are capable of living outside, so they are free-standing entities that can survive on their own. Viruses have to live inside of our cells. That's one of the big differences between bacteria and viruses. But that poses a thorny problem for our immune system, right? If the viruses are inside of our cells, how can our immune system even see them? So let me just walk you through an influenza infection here. Uh, we just went through the longest season of influenza in the United States that we've ever had, so it seemed timely to focus on this. So up here at the top whoop, is the purple influenza virus, and this pink thing is meant to be one of our cells. So the first thing that happens is the virus hits the cell, is taken up by the cell, and it's going to live inside the cell. It does something called uncoding, which means the virus sort of opens up, and it releases its own chromosomes. Those chromosomes are then going to tell the cell to make more of the virus. So that's shown down here in the bottom right. Whoops. And then it's eventually going to bud off and make new viruses. So when the virus is inside the cell, it's invisible to our immune system in terms of the neutrophils. The neutrophils can't see it. But the T cells understand that those cells are infected. And in order to get rid of the virus, it has to kill the cell that's harboring the virus. So when you have a viral infection, when you're coughing up all that horrible stuff, a lot of the stuff you're coughing up are the cells that have been killed by your T cells that were trying to get rid of the virus. So if you could look at the goo under the microscope, you would see your epithelial cells, the lining of your respiratory tract, and you would find some of these T cells that are actually killing those cells. So it's a very destructive process. So I'm going to show you how a T cell kills. This, again, is an influenza-infected cell. It's coming. So the T cell's at the bottom, and the influenza-infected cell is on top. It's the big thing. Now, there's two parts to this I love. So one thing, the T cell has to contact the cell, and it's actually going to inject killing agents into the cell. That's what's happening right now. You're going to see the influenza-infected cell die. See how it sort of grew, and now it's going to shrink with all the blood? So it's dying. But here's the part I love the most. Look, the T cell's not giving up. It's trying to get in a few more slugs. I love that. It never gives up. I can watch this movie all day long. <laughs> still, still, it's saying... All right, enough of that. Um, so that is how T cells kill virally infected targets. So you can sense it's quite different than the issue with bacteria, where the neutrophils just sort of come, do it, and it's done. This is a very different landscape. Now, it turns out that viruses can kill cells as well. And so this is actually in a test tube. So these are virally infected cells. It's not influenza. Sometimes the viruses kill cells. And the reason I bring this up is that those dead cells are uh, gross and we don't want them. And here is where the neutrophils come in again. Neutrophils are the cleanup crew. So when you've had a virus infection, all of those dead cells, all of the cells that were killed by the T cells, they have to get cleaned up. And it's the neutrophils that do that. In that process, there are hormones that are released, and you're going to hear this word a lot at the meeting, cytokines. Cytokines are just hormones of the immune system. But those cytokines drive the fever, the achiness, the fatigue. We know that the reason you feel crummy when you have an infection is those cytokines. Now, they're part of killing off the infection, but they're also why we feel so crummy. All right, so I'm going to give you a few more details about both of these. So we need to talk a little bit more about lymphocytes because they're the more complicated part of our immune system. Now, you remember the picture I showed you of the neutrophil? It was sort of a lovely purple cell in the middle with a very um, sort of modern art-looking nucleus. This is now a lymphocyte with a perfectly round dinner plate of a nucleus, the dark purple in the middle. So lymphocytes, by definition, are small, round white cells. There are three categories, and you have probably heard your immunologists talk about these. B cells, T cells, and natural killer cells. Often they will do a lymphocyte panel and they will count those. We do that a lot to monitor how people are doing and how strong their immune system is. So what are those three cell types? B cells are the cells that grow up to make antibody. They are trained to make antibody against infectious threats. Now, technically, once they're doing that, they're called a plasma cell, and I'll show you a picture of that. T cells, as I showed you, have a couple of functions. Their main function is to kill virally infected target cells, but they also are the governors of the immune system. And I'll say more about that in a minute because that's some of the more difficult um, nomenclature to learn. And then the natural killer cells. So there is a session on natural killer cell disorders later today. 
These cells are very important for the defense against herpes viruses. And when I say herpes, you're probably thinking about cold sores, but there's actually a much bigger family that includes Epstein-Barr virus, cytomegalovirus, and other types of herpes viruses. So natural killer cells are important for those viruses specifically. So let's talk about T cell types. As I said, here's where the nomenclature gets the most difficult and thorny. So I want to just spend a little bit of time on this. The first thing you typically look at on a lymphocyte panel when you're thinking about T cells are helper T cells and cytotoxic T cells. Those are also known as CD4 T cells and CD8 T cells. And what's the functional difference? Why would we count those and why would we look at them separately? So CD4 T cells are really these governors that I've been talking about, the cells that kind of say, you go and fight over there, you go and fight over there. They're really the governors of the immune system. But importantly, these are the cells that license B cells to go and make antibody. These are the cells that actually come into the lymph node contact the B cell and say, yep, okay, you're a good guy, go out and make antibody. So these are important to remember, and I'll say a few more words about that in a minute. And then the CD8 T cells, their primary role is in the defense against viruses, as we've talked about. Now, uh, so you thought that was hard. It's getting a little bit harder here. So these CD4 T cells, these governors, actually come in a whole host of flavors. You will hear a little bit more about this in some of the disease-specific sessions today. So I wanted to just say once what these are so that you've heard it. So you will hear people talk about T-cell polarization or T-cell differentiation. That references this kind of functional subsetting of the CD4 T-cells. So I'm just going to go through them quickly. So the top one in purple that says TFH stands for follicular helper T-cell. This is the T cell that actually tells the B cells to make antibody. TH2 cells, today when we talk about it, we talk about them from the perspective of allergy, but that's not why we evolved them. We didn't evolve them so that we could all get allergies. We evolved them to defend against worms. Worms, not a big problem in the U.S. today. Um, TH1 cells are important for the defense against bacteria and a particular type of intracellular bacteria called mycobacteria. TH17 cells are important for the defense against candida, primarily a yeast. And the T regulatory cells are important in putting the brakes on autoimmune disease. If your T regs are perfect and everything else in your immune system is working, you should not get autoimmune disease. So T regs are your safety net so you don't develop autoimmune disease. So you can imagine that this array of regulatory cells, these CD4 cells that are sort of spreading out and making sure the other cells are doing what they're supposed to do, this is quite a level of complexity. And it's only in about the last 10 years that we've understood the role of these cells. Now I need to leave you with one other concept about T cells, and that is memory. So one of the most beautiful parts of our immune system, I think, is that we don't have to catch the same things over and over again. Now that's presuming your immune system is perfectly functional. When I was little, I had chicken pox. I still have antibodies, even though that was over 50 years ago, I still have antibodies to chicken pox, and I also have T cells that recognize the chicken pox virus. Why is that important? That antibody that I have is my shield so that I won't catch chicken pox again. That antibody is what the vaccines are supposed to induce in people so that you will not catch measles, mumps, rubella, chicken pox, tetanus. That wall of antibody is what defends us from catching things in the first place. The T cells are important for clearance after you have a virus. And having memory means that they'll be faster at doing that. So T cells have a very important quality, and that's called memory. So let me sum up what I've just said to you and hopefully give you some take-home points. So I'm going to sum up bacterial infections first because they're the easiest. I'd like to highlight that there's a session on respiratory infections at 2 o'clock today. So for a bacterial infection, what happens is the neutrophils are alerted. I really only showed you in the video how the neutrophils sort of migrate, but they migrate towards the bacteria. They snarf it up, eat it, digest it, and kill it. If you have more antibody and good complement, that makes the process much more efficient. That's really it for bacteria. It's not any more complicated than that. Viruses are a little more difficult, so the cells get infected and the T cells have to recognize the virus inside of our cells. The T cells are alerted in our lymph nodes and then they go out to fight the infection. They release cytokines, which cause some of the features of just feeling sick and crummy. 
And neutrophils will show up and clean up all of the dead cells. And it's our antibody that means we don't have to do that over and over and over again. It's our antibody, again, that's our shield so we don't catch the same thing more than once. So that brings us to antibody. So how does the B cell know to make antibody? Um, so one of the key things is that it has to be in a lymph node. So many of you, I'm guessing, in the room have been told by your immunologist your tonsils are quite small, or, oh my goodness, I don't see any tonsils. Tonsils are a readily visible part of our immune system. They're one of those blue lymphoid organs that I showed you. For me as an immunologist, if someone has unusually small tonsils, it usually says to me that their B cells aren't cranking on all cylinders because a normally sized tonsil would be populated by B cells. So um, how does the B cell know to make antibody? It must be in, oops, sorry, the lymph node. They must see antigen. The antigen is brought there. Antigen is just a fancy word for whatever the infection is. And then you need T cells to help the B cells make antibody. Now, the final stage of a B cell's life is to be a plasma cell. And as a plasma cell, it lives in the bone marrow for a very long time. So as I just said, I had chicken pox when I was maybe seven or eight, so over 50 years ago, and I'm still making antibody to chicken pox. It can last that long. So here's the lymph node picture that I've been promising you. So the gray zone in the middle that looks like sort of a squishy cloud with a purple interior, that's where the T cells live. The yellow circles are where the B cells live, and most of the time the lymph nodes are at rest and the cells are just hanging out waiting for something to happen. But when there is an infection, a signal goes to the closest lymph node to that infection, and this blue expanded uh, bubble that I've got for you starts to happen. So here's where those follicular helper T cells, remember one of the types of CD4 T cells, come, grow, expand, and they start talking to the B cells here. Oh, I lost my arrow. Here and they tell the B cells to go forth and make antibody to whatever that infectious threat is. So you can appreciate how the structure is really important. It's gonna facilitate that interaction. So here's a picture of some B cells on the left, and I just wanna contrast it with plasma cells on the right. The plasma cells are big and blobby, and that sort of clear zone in the middle, right here, this is basically antibody jello. This is so much antibody that it actually makes a pocket inside the cell and that's gonna get secreted into the bloodstream and that's where our antibody comes from. So that's when everything works right. What happens in autoimmune disease? So B cells and T cells make mistakes. They do undergo a training to recognize self. Each of our selves is very individual. So the B cells are trained not to attack us, not to make antibodies to ourselves. This concept is generally called tolerance and it's a very powerful concept in immunology that our immune system has to be trained to not attack us. But things can go wrong. And so, and we actually refer to that as broken tolerance. It's a very visual description of this idea that if you have autoimmune disease, something in the tolerance educational process didn't work right. One way to think about that is if your immune system is weak or it's missing a part, that means the rest of the immune system is working double time. It's no different than when you're at work and someone calls out sick. You have to work extra hard to compensate more likely to make mistakes, right? You're more likely to drop the pencil on the floor. You're more likely to miss that post-it note that someone left for you. Same concept in the immune system. If the immune system is having to work double time and overtime extra hard to compensate, it's much more likely to make a mistake. And that's what happens in autoimmune disease. So the concept of autoimmune disease is that it's either B cells or T cells making a mistake. It can be either one or both. Some examples are rheumatoid arthritis, diabetes mellitus, Sjogren's syndrome, inflammatory bowel disease, any organ in the body can be affected, just like any organ in the body can have an infection. Now, there are some primary immune deficiencies in which autoimmune disease is the most dominant thing. It's, it's much more um, common and it's much more important to the patient than infections, and there's a special session on that today at 3.15. So I'm gonna contrast uh, autoimmunity with inflammation. Uh, inflammation has been recognized since the ancient Greeks. So the ancient Greeks referred to it as um, red, hot, tender, swollen. I think they used fancy Greek words back then, but that was the idea. Um, one way to think of it is the fire inside. So you do not need to be a doctor to look at this foot and figure out which one has inflammation, right? It's red, hot, tender, swollen. That is the essence of inflammation. So this happens to be arthritis. You might not think of gingivitis as inflammation, but it is. 
It's red hot, tender, and swollen. So that is also inflammation. And then skin, this is just another example. It's just a different organ affected by inflammation. So just like the immune system can be anywhere in the body, inflammation can be anywhere in the body. So again, it just references red hot, tender, and swollen any place that it happens. It's largely due to cytokines, these hormones of the immune system. Sometimes there are white cells involved as well, and usually it's neutrophils. And then the swelling part has to do with leakiness of the blood vessels. The blood vessels start to leak, and that's what causes the swelling. So inflammation can happen on its own, but it often happens as part of an autoimmune disease. A great example of that is arthritis. Arthritis is an autoimmune disease, but the joints get very red, hot, tender, and swollen. So it can occur in the company of autoimmune disease, but it can also occur on its own. How do we treat inflammation? Well, uh, there's non-steroidal anti-inflammatories, which actually work, so things like Motrin and Naproxen. There's methotrexate, but today, because we are very, uh, we are at the dawn of precision medicine for immune deficiencies, we can sometimes target those um, cytokines, those inflammatory hormones. We have medications that are directed to those specifically that act like a sponge to soak them up and take them out of us. So those are all strategies to treat inflammation. Sometimes the better part of valor is to actually look for the underlying cause and to try and address that. So if I was gonna sum up autoimmunity and inflammation, it's important to remember that we have the elements of these as part of our normal immune system. It's just they've made a mistake. It's not that the cells are in and of themselves bad. They're just uh, doing bad things. So when it's, when it's T cells and B cells that are going wrong, it's autoimmune disease. When it's neutrophils and monocytes going bad, it's inflammation. And the treatments are correspondingly quite different, although, as I said, it's not unusual at all to have overlap between autoimmune disease and inflammation. All right, so we're in the home stretch now. I'm going to talk a little bit about GI health and brain health, and then I'm going to end with just a little bit about genetics. So you have read this. It's been in the news for the last few years. We have 100 trillion bacteria on us and in us. Um, I don't care how well you wash this morning. It's just true for all of us. So particularly in our GI tracts, we have about a pound and a half of bacteria. We have more bacteria on us and in us than we have human cells. We are well outnumbered by the microbes. There are about 10,000 species, and although we generally talk about bacteria, it's important to remember that there are also viruses and fungi that comprise this microbial community that sort of uh, envelops us every day. We know much less about the viruses and fungi than we do the bacteria. What we do know about the bacteria is that there's a huge diversity and that that diversity is important for tuning the immune system in our gut. Remember, the immune system percolates through every organ. We have a distinct immune system in our gut, and those bacteria are important for tuning our immune system, and that immune system in turn is important for constraining the microbiome in our gut. There's a symbiotic relationship. And boy, do we monkey with that every day, right? Every antibiotic sort of tweaks the microbial community. Everything about that is just doomed to be flawed. And so no surprise that in primary immune deficiency, GI health is the number two concern after fatigue. It really is very difficult. I have not dumbed down this description for you. This is, I work in a GI clinic. This is literally the level that we understand it at. So, there is a lot of research being dedicated to understanding this microbial community, but we do not understand how to fix it, how to tweak it, how to modify it. Um, we're not there yet. So one of the problems is, is that when we look at the microbes in the gut, we can't really tell the good from the bad very often. Sometimes we can, but not, not always. And importantly, we don't know how to encapsulate the good ones and give it to people as a therapeutic. So we know the bacteria are important for the immune system. We know specifically that probiotics help for antibiotic-associated diarrhea. There's sort of a variation on this theme. You may have uh, heard about cow colostrum that you can buy that is sort of other, it's cow antibody that you swallow, <coughs> excuse me, and that's supposed to tune the microbial community in your gut. Um, there's not much data on it, but there's a little bit of data suggesting that it helps. You no doubt have also heard about fecal transplants. Now, probably what you heard is that this is on hold right now because two people died after a fecal transplant. The concept of a fecal transplant is gross but simple. So the idea is if you've got dysregulated bugs in the gut, why not get good bugs from a healthy person, take them, and restore the normal community in the gut? It's a very simple concept and a very attractive one, if gross. Um, 
It has a lot of promise, and it definitely works for C. diff. The people that died, died because they had inflammation in their gut, and whenever you change the microbial community, it drives inflammation. We don't like that. <coughs> Excuse me. That's the essence of traveler's diarrhea, is that you go somewhere and there's a different microbial community. So um, it is currently on hold in the United States. All right, so there is a session on GI health tomorrow at 11, and I'm going to end with the brain. So the Immune Deficiency Foundation does a number of surveys. I hope that many of you have participated in them. In addition, they have supported research on the subject of fatigue. And uh, we know, as physicians, that it's a problem. In fact, for me, it's the number one concern that I hear from patients with common variable. We know what doesn't work. We know more immunoglobulin doesn't help. We know antibiotics don't help. So we've already eliminated two big things. We know it's probably related to these inflammatory hormones, the cytokines, but we don't know which ones, and we don't know who has this problem versus who doesn't have this problem. But I promise you, there are a lot of smart people working on this, and we will find a way to help. <coughs> we know that T cells are important for brain health. So on the left-hand side, you see a healthy brain. I'm going to try and pull up my arrow here. And there are T cells that circulate around the brain in a healthy circumstance. They're actually patrolling the surface of the brain, and they're looking for problems, and they're trying to reestablish baseline. But those same T cells can cause a problem if they go into the brain. So they're healthy on the outside, but they're a problem on the inside. <coughs> Excuse me, sorry. So there is a session on fatigue tomorrow at 11, and as I said, it's going to be led by Jude Hajar, who's actually done most of the research on fatigue in the U.S. All right, I'm going to end with a little talk on genetics, a little nomenclature. This is just to give you some tools so that when you go to the disease-specific sessions, you have a little bit more of a background. And why did I decide to include genetics? When I showed you the graph that there were 400 different primary immune deficiencies, those are 400 different genetically defined primary immune deficiencies. We use genes more and more to determine treatment. We use genetics more and more for diagnosis. So it's important to start getting familiar with the language. So why should I care? Well, more and more genetics are the op defining the optimal treatment. There is a session on genetics specifically in acknowledgement of that. Uh, and there's a session on genetic counseling tomorrow. So let's get to the meat of it here. So a key concept is we inherit one set of chromosomes from mom, one set of chromosomes from dad. That's a key concept. We have two copies of chromosome 1, two copies of chromosome 2, so on and so forth. So this is important because you will hear doctors today talk about autosomal recessive. What does that mean? That's a circumstance where both parents are carriers. So you can think of cystic fibrosis. Parents don't have the disease. They carry the gene. They get married. They have kids. And sometimes their children will have cystic fibrosis. So that's shown here. We have the dad carrying the mutation. We have the mom carrying the mutation. One of the children here has the misfortune of having one mutated copy from each parent, and that causes the autosomal recessive disease. These two kids here will be carriers. They will not have the disease. And this fortunate child here didn't get either of the mutated genes from either parent. So that's autosomal recessive. I'm now going to show you autosomal dominant in contrast. So the concept of autosomal dominant is you need only one flawed gene to manifest the disease. So that's shown here on the left. So here, the dad is carrying the mutation. The mom does not. And these two children have the mutated gene. And all of the purple people in this kindred have the disease, whatever the disease is. And then there are two kids here that didn't inherit the affected gene and do not have the disease. So classically in autosomal dominant, you will see it passed from grandparent to parent to child. But that doesn't always have to happen. So what I'm showing you on the right is this concept that in some cases it's a new mutation in the family. You don't have to have multiple family members affected to have an autosomal dominant condition. It can be a new mutation, and that's shown here. Now, I mentioned that one of, the increase, one of the reasons I decided to talk about this here and one of the reasons that I think it's increasingly relevant for people with primary immune deficiencies is that it is dictating treatment. So the genes are listed on the left-hand side. I'm not going to read them. It's just the concept that different genes dictate the optimal treatment. That's why if your doctors are talking to you about getting sequencing, that's why. We want to understand whether you have 
common variable due to a miscellaneous ar array of um, genes or whether there's a single gene because that might change our treatment for you. So we've talked about chromosomes and the inheritance pattern. Genes are part of the chromosomes and then this is meant to be uh, the DNA itself and I just want to show you a tiny bit about sequencing since I brought it up. There are two kinds of sequencing and you will get more details on this if you go to the genetics talk. So if, if I see a patient and I'm pretty sure I know what that patient has and I just want to sequence that one gene to confirm it, I will get something called Sanger sequencing. The reason is it's not very expensive, the turnaround time is rapid, and the technology is the most robust. We have the most experience with it, it's been around the longest. So there are compelling reasons to do that. More and more it's being supplanted by something called whole exome sequencing where we start sequencing at chromosome one and we sequence right through to chromosome X or Y. So it's more expensive, the technology is not as robust, but it gives you a much more holistic picture of that person's genetics. Instead of just one gene, you're looking at the whole person. And then I think five years or maybe even two years when this meeting happens again, it's likely that something called whole genome sequencing will supplant that. So you have heard about Watson and Crick. You've probably seen the model of the double helix, so that is reproduced for you here on the left-hand side. And notice in the double helix there's a ladder. So these are the bases, and this is the actual sequence of the DNA. So it's nicely shown in color there, and believe it or not, when we do sequencing, we actually get results back in color. So that's shown on the right. This is just what the computer puts out when you do sequencing. When you do whole exome sequencing and you've got this massive amount of data, you can't read that with your eyeball. You need a computer to filter it. So I'm just showing you here conceptually this concept that you've got a billion different bases, a billion different ACTG. You have to use a computer to help you filter it. No human being can go through that. So where are we going? Well, I mentioned that more and more immune deficiencies are defined by genetics. And I think uh, genetics is definitely the wave of the future. And it's been responsible for this doubling in the past 10 years. So some last thoughts to help you, uh, if this is your first meeting, some last thoughts to help you get the most out of this meeting. This meeting is for you. It's not for me. Um, ask questions of the faculty. We are here of our own volition. We're here because we believe in this community. We also want to be part of your herd. You will seldom see this many experts in one place, so definitely squeeze as much information as you can out of each and every faculty, but learn from each other. I learn so much from my patients. All of my best tips come from patients or parents of patients, so definitely take the time to meet your friends and neighbors and learn from them as well, and importantly, Teach the doctors that are here. What's on your mind? What are your problems? What should we be paying attention to in terms of research? That's one of the reasons IDF has supported research in fatigue. It's because of people like you saying that this is a priority. So definitely get out there and embrace the meeting. And I have one last thought. We are all superheroes in our own way. So go forth and be a part of this amazing community. Thank you very much. So I'm going to take uh, four questions here. Where do I get testing for complement disorders? So complement, um, there are only a few places that offer complement testing. One is AREP and one is National Jewish Hospital, but they can be sent from any center. So they are widely available. What T cell is a sign you have autoimmune disease? And what cell is missing? So the problem is it's not a cell that's missing, it's a cell that's made a mistake. And often we can't pluck it out of your blood and say, oh, that's the bad cell. Sometimes we can, but not very often. So we, instead, we, we look for biomarkers of autoimmune disease, um, and that can be things like uh, T cells that are too low, T cells that are unbalanced with more CD8 cells than CD4 cells, so there's different biomarkers to look at. Um, oh, working in children's GI, when does it translate to adult GI? Um, so some institutions have a rule that at age 18 years you have to migrate over to an adult provider. Uh, I tend not to do that because we don't have so many adult providers that are well versed in immune deficiency. So um, I think it's up to each institution to transition. This question is fairly specific. Red blotches and swollen ankles, are these related to an immune disorder? So certainly that sounds like it could be arthritis. 
you can have arthritis and not be immune deficient. So I have terrible arthritis and I'm not immune deficient. Um, but certainly the risk of arthritis goes up if you do have an immune deficiency. Again, the concept that a flawed immune system is going to make mistakes. And the last question. So do you find it common for patients with common variable to have their tonsils and adenoids removed due to constant infections? I do. Um, I have heard that from so many patients. I think it's under the umbrella of just having too many infections if you have common variable. Colleen, we have to end. Um, what are the, this is actually a great uh, question and one that I wish I'd incorporated into my talk. So thank you for whoever did this. What are the pros and cons of cytokines inhibitors versus non-steroidals, and would it help in common variable? We are using cytokine inhibitors more and more in common variable without actually a lot of experience. So remember, cytokine inhibitors are going to soak up all of those inflammatory hormones. The idea is, is that they can calm down autoimmune lung disease, they can calm down hot joints, they can be incredibly effective. But in fact, we don't know if there are special risks of using them in people with common variable. You might imagine that there are, that the risks that are um, collected by the FDA from the general population aren't necessarily identical to those in patients with common variable. And I would urge you to participate in registries and surveys to help people understand that. It's such a unique community, the FDA isn't going to pay attention to it. We have to come together as a community to answer questions like that. So um, whoever asked that question, I thank you. That's a really good question and really important. Um, this is the last question. Um, so it's two parts. So looking, so John Boyle talked about this in his opening session, how it's so frustrating for patients to have to go and explain their condition to each and every doctor that they see. That is so frustrating. I don't have an easy fix. IDF does a lot of physician education. In fact, tomorrow they have a whole session where they're going to be educating physicians locally in primary immune deficiencies. So it's not for lack of effort. It's just really hard to get all the information that's needed into the right hands. Um, so I don't have a great answer for you there. But, but the follow-up question is, uh, what about uh, pulmonary disease? I'm sorry, skin itching. Um, and skin itching is a thorny problem. And uh, just to show you how interesting skin itching is, is it turns out that there's a new drug being tested that specifically erases skin itching. It does nothing else to your immune system. It just blocks skin itching. So it's not approved yet. But who would have thought that skin itching was driven by the immune system? Is that not one of the most incredible concepts ever? So it's actually driven by one of these cytokines. And they have developed an inhibitor to address that because many people have skin itching with eczema, with other conditions. And who'd have guessed itching was related to the immune system? So I'm going to leave you with that fascinating factoid. And I encourage you all to go and embrace the meeting.